Hey everybody, how you doing? Alright, so a few disclaimers really quick. I am not a public speaker, so I am nervous, but we're going to push through, alright? Cool. Also, second disclaimer. The views expressed today are not of FDUs at all. These are of myself and Dr. Osako. All right? Um, just a little background of this series right now. Um, this is kind of an extension of my development as a black man in a sense. Um, Trayvon Martin, 2012, that was the first thing that really um, kicked me off to really realizing, oh, it's real out here. I was realizing all my life. Then, 2015, Freddie A. Gray heard. I came to school mad. No one knew. And when I looked around, no one was talking about the situations going on. And that kind of had the idea sparked in my mind of what can I do to actually cause a change on campus to make sure that our students are aware of what's going on. So Charlottesville uh, occurred this past year and our dean of students actually put up the idea of what can we do for our students to make sure that they're learning the things that they need to learn and that they're addressing their privileges, et cetera. So this idea was really sparked my mind even more, like, oh, this is an opportunity for me actually to make an impact on the FDU community. So um, with this, the birth of the Real Talk session kind of uh, originated. So my idea of the Real Talk uh, sessions series is to provide a space to represent and address the issues of all people of color. Um, and also on the flip side of that, it's an opportunity for non-people of color to be able to actually experience the candid conversations that they usually aren't privy to. And in turn, my goal is for those individuals to actually take that knowledge, the information that they were able to access, and to use their privilege to fight these inequalities and injustices that are going on. So that is the premise of the Real Talk sessions. Um, hopefully I'll be having other topics ranging from a lot of different things, but this is our first one we're gonna kick off. Um, first off, I would definitely like to thank Campus Life and EOF for allowing this opportunity for us to present this information to you all. Um, it's a different type of event, but it's an event that's needed because we always have an elephant in the room at FDU, which is race, but we're gonna to touch it. That's why it's called Real Talk Sessions. It's gonna be unfiltered conversations without any coding, et cetera. Now, I want all your feedback. So if you hear something good now or think about it later, use the hashtag FDU Real Talk. Once again, the hashtag is FDU Real Talk. Um, myself, I'll be gauging on that. Uh, Dr. Seppel possibly might jump in the conversation too. So let's just get the conversation going that needs to happen, okay? All right. Like I said, I'm not a uh, person that does this, so I have two parts. <laughs> <laughs> you like that, right? Okay. So, um, our upcoming guest, she's an award winning researcher. Um, Dr. Osefo is one of the influential voices in politics, social justice, and a highly sought after political commentator and strategist. Uh, Dr. Osefo is a professor of education at the John Hopkins University in Maryland. She's also a contributor at The Hill. She is the founder of, and CEO of the 1954 the Equity Project LLC. <laughs> She also has provided commentary and analysis for Fox Business, Risk and Reward, Fox and Friends, TV One's News One Now with Roland Martin, and ABC's Armstrong Williams Show, just to name a few. If you look her up, her resume is serious. <laughs> History was made in 2016 when Dr. Osefo was the first black woman to earn a PhD in public affairs community development from Rutgers University. So y'all clap it up on that, that's good. <laughs> Dr. Osefo is also the 2017 recipient of the John Hopkins Diversity Recognition Award, the 2017 uh, recipient of the John Hopkins Outstanding Graduate Award, uh, a Baltimore Business Journal 40 under further honoree, and a 25 Women to Watch honoree also. So she's big, doing big things, and she will be doing even more big things in the future. So please give a great FDU Devils welcome to the phenomenal woman, Dr. Wendy Osuck. Okay, so how's it going to go? We have a series of different questions touching on um, race, gender, leadership, etc. 
Um, so to start off, can you let the FU crowd know a little bit about who Dr. What Yourself was, your journey, and how you chose your career path? Sure, so that is a great question. But first, how are you guys doing? Good. I am so glad to be here. You guys are so beautiful. Um, all right, so <laughs> you guys are. Um, so a little bit about me in a nutshell. So how did I get here and my journey and my path? It is a mixed bag, but I think it's a nice story, especially for students who are at college, because it shows you that where you think you're going to end up, you sometimes don't. So I was born in Nigeria. So I think, so I'll say this. 
Being out of undergrad, I will tell you unequivocally, your undergraduate degree and experience is going to be the best four years of your life. But understand this, you can have fun and still do well academically. That's what people miss. I'm not just saying that as someone who's like, oh, she's trying to push it. No, 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 no. If you think life is hard now, wait until you graduate. <laughs> this is easy. And I know you guys are like, what? No, trust me. I am that person who's talking to you and saying, no, like, I want you guys to get straight A's because it can be done now. Working and all that other stuff and juggling family, that's hard. And if anyone tells you it's cool not to do well in undergrad, don't listen to them. This lays the foundation for everything. I have friends, and this is what I did do in undergrad, I never interned. Make sure you take every intern opportunity you can. Do you want to know why? People would rather hire you to do work for free than pay you to do the same job. It's easier to get an internship than it is to get a job in that same company. So make sure you take that. So the best lesson I learned was actually from my friends, who, and my husband and I talk about this all the time, our friends who are doing well now, and we're like, but weren't we just partying together at the club when we were undergrad, or weren't we just in the cafeteria hanging out? We're like, yeah, but I did my work before I came. And we're like, man, we didn't know that. We thought we were all in this together. <laughs> So I have 
still want, if I'm negotiating contracts and it's about money, I can call them because they have experience in that field. I have someone I can call who's a woman in my field if I want to say, is it hard juggling kids and a career? I have someone in my board of directors that I call who is on the grind and hustling just like me when I'm ready to give up. And they're like, no, 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 don't give up, we're all going to do it. So mentorship is not that one person who provides all the information for you. Mentorship is literally a group of people who you can call upon at different stages in your life who will support you. And you should have a mentor at every stage in their own professional so have someone who's just starting out so you guys can share war stories. Have someone who probably just made it so they can be a motivation for you to say, you know what, if you keep on going, you'll eventually get there. Have someone who's been there who's done that, you know? And have someone who has failed a lot of times. People often overlook that. Sometimes people have this thing that says, I will never take advice from someone who's not in a relationship about my relationship. No, no. You need to ask why are they not in a relationship because sometimes that experience will help you because of the mistakes they made. I have an aunt that is divorced and some of my biggest nuggets have been from her as far as what to do in a marriage. Don't overlook those people. That's really important. And something I also was taught was someone told me um, when we were talking about like a singular mentor who should make up your board of directors. They said the best mentor is someone who no longer has anything to prove. Because they can really just be open and candid with you. Because we're not naive here. Sometimes people might be like, oh, this person's a younger version of me, I don't want to just pass my legs here, or something like that. But sometimes when people have nothing else and they're good, done that, made my millions, I'm okay. The words in which they will share with you are invaluable. So I would say, don't look for one mentor, but as you go through life, take people on that journey with you who will make up your board of directors. Thank you. Um, so you got this part. You out here, you're probably fly on the TV, right? <laughs> so I guess. <laughs> but I'm sure along the way you had some failures, right? Yeah. So can you tell us about your biggest failure and what did you learn from that? <clears throat> this is a good one. For me, it's good. So I've had many failures. I feel like I fail often. I fail like on a weekly basis. And that's because I always put so many goals up. But I'll tell you one of the biggest ones that my inner circle still kicks me about till today. When I got out of college, I had an internship with, at the time, Representative Gillibrand from New York. Do you guys know who that is? Yes, some people do. I got a job as an intern, I was living in Baltimore, and she was on Capitol Hill in DC. It was the first day of my internship. I was like, man, I don't feel like waking up. I don't want to catch the train to go to DC. I'm not, I'm not. So I called in sick. I wasn't sick. This is being recorded, so I'm like, whatever. But I wasn't sick. <laughs> <laughs> and I never went to that internship. The next day went, I was still sick. Your Emerald's third day, I never went because I was like, I'm out of college, I want to make money, this is free, I'm traveling, this makes no sense. Fast forward two years, I get a call. At that time, it was my boyfriend, now husband. He said, um, We'll stay with that uh, senator you were supposed to be I said, Yes, I heard it in you know, you know, the He said, But I'll see you then. And she became the person who took over the Senate seat that Hillary Clinton vacated. And I'm like, oh, man, are you serious? So I emailed. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I emailed the person who hired me at the time. Hey! <laughs> No response. Till today. He, he probably was like, oh, back then, y'all didn't want me, y'all not wrong, right? <laughs> no. But the funny part is, not only did that not respond, but if anybody's keeping up with politics, 
Gillibrand is now one of the front runners to run for president in 2020. So if she's not the president, they said it should be the VP. So basically, what I'm saying is that my biggest failure is because I wanted that momentary satisfaction of money. I didn't want to grind. I didn't want to hustle for it because they were paying me. But what's so interesting is all of her staff from then are still some way, some fashion in her life now. And she will probably be some way in the White House in 2020. And I did not do it because I didn't want to wake up. Imagine telling your kids, yeah, I go work for Obama, but I just didn't want to wake up. <laughs> Because this is the Google you know, generation. Literally, if I have a question, I can always Google it. 
And I think that that's the beauty of everything. Um, I think technology hurts because we are also in the Instagram generation. And what I mean by that is we take moments in time and think that's what it is. And that's not true. So technology can help you because it's a very easier tool, right? You have it at your possession, you always have a phone on you, you have a computer. So technology can serve as a way for you to learn things quicker than most. It's a tutorial for everything. I literally learned how to code by watching a Google video. I have no idea how to do it through computers, but that's what technology gave me. But with the Instagram generation and social media generation, it gives a fake perception of reality. And I think that you have to be able to do that delicate dance. You know, technology is a tool, but don't take everything which you see on those social media platforms as face value. Um, so on top of the stuff you see on social media, um, you deal with like a lot of heavy topics. Yeah. Like, the base of people that willingly choose ignorance um, when there's facts on a regular basis. And that's on top of you being a black woman. How do you deal with that fatigue? It's heavy. And some days it's heavier than others. Um, some days I'll get off the TV. <laughs> I always tell the story. So I'm usually on Fox News, I was on there last night. And the moment my name comes up or I come up on the stream, my phone starts vibrating. And I'm like, dude, I haven't even opened my mouth yet. But you see, I'm a black woman, and it's already like, you dumb, you don't know, like, can I open my mouth? So there is a lot of fatigue that comes with it because you get assaulted sometimes, not even for your dance, but simply because of what you look like. And that's hard. And I have some colleagues in the media industry who have said, I refuse to do certain segments because they know what comes with it. And so it is a decision I have made because at the end of the day, I don't need to convince people who look like me about what our everyday struggle is. We know what our everyday struggle is. My goal in life is to talk to people who have never met someone who looks like me, who have never met someone who comes from my background, and say, wow, you know, I may not agree with what you said, but you made me look at X, Y, and Z situation differently. And that's my goal. And so the fatigue is very heavy, especially with social media when they have access to you. I receive like, I literally receive death threats at my job. Um, I get letters all the time. Um, and it's not just through social media, it's like people sending things to your place of employment. But unfortunately, this is what comes with our society. And that's why I always talk on social media. Sometimes when I say, oh, she's on TV, this is so great. Yeah, but it also comes with being called the N-word every single day, being called the B-word all the time, um, being told to go back to your country because I have a foreign last name. There are things that come with this, but I spoke about my sons earlier. I have a four-year-old and a two-year-old, and my goal is to leave this world better for them than the world that I came into. And if that takes the sacrifices of being called names, then, you know, it is what it is. But I, I have a clear goal, and I will not be deterred from that. So, the sun is in school, so we have a question for you. Yes. So, yes. you said you like track music. Yeah. Right? So, when you're down and out, you don't want to deal with, with anyone at all. Uh -huh. Sometimes music inspires you and makes you feel good again. Uh -huh. What's the one song that you turn to to, be, to get, get that motivation, to get back your toes? To get that motivation, to get back to my toes. What is like my one song? Okay, so. I love Gucci Man. <laughs> Why are y'all laughing? We're family, right? Like, I love Gucci. I really, really do. Um, but my song, I, my favorite song right now is Migos and Gucci Slipper. That is my, like, just the instrumental. What? I love Have you 
ever been labeled or perceived as an angry black woman? All the time. I feel like if you ask people on Fox and show my face, what's her name? They're like, angry black woman. <laughs> I feel like that stigma exists because it is part of the plantation mentality. It is the way for them to say, stay in your place. The moment you speak up, you are not fighting for yourself, you're not fighting for your brothers, you're not fighting for your sisters. You are angry for no reason. And that is their way of saying, shut up. The same way they say that to Colin Kaepernick. We're not getting into that, but I'm going to say it. Colin Kaepernick, the reason why they're saying you should not kneel is because he is speaking up. The moment you speak up, they will do things to try to make it such that your voice should be silenced. Back in the day, people who looked like you, if they spoke up, they would be lynched. They would be killed. And not only would they be lynched, they would be lynched and left hanging for other people who look like them to say, if you speak up, you too will end up like that. So when you tell me I'm an angry black woman, what you're really telling me is I'm a strong black woman, and I'm yeah. going to make the point. And I'm going to point that can influence a crowd. Because if you silence me, you know that that message will not go out. So call me an angry black woman if you want to. What you're doing is you are telling me that what I'm doing is going perfectly fine. So you've developed a way to cope with it. So can you offer any advice to the young woman that may be dealing with it now and will in the future? Absolutely. You know, I think. One thing I have been very mindful of whenever I'm on TV is my delivery. We always have heard the adage when it comes to black and brown people, you have to be twice as good, twice as smart to get high. So even though I have other commentators who can go on TV and who, you know, yell and scream, that's usually not my approach. Because if they already think you're an angry black woman just by your mere existence, imagine what happens when you start yelling and screaming. So to my younger sisters, I will say, be mindful of your delivery. You want people to hear your message, not necessarily hear your voice. I will repeat that because there's a difference. You want people to hear your message, but not your voice. Your message should be louder than your voice. And keep that in mind. And don't be afraid when you are silent. Be encouraged. Because if your delivery is okay, you're not yelling, you're not screaming, you're articulating yourself in a respectful manner, then there's no reason why you should be silenced. So keep on going and know that all those who came before you had to deal with the same thing. If Michelle Obama is considered an angry black woman, then who am I to be offended when someone calls me an angry black woman? when she is the most educated first lady who has ever resided at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. Mm -hmm. So you guys do not be discouraged. Your voice is beautiful, but your message is even better. This, these, this right here is my girl. This right here, right here. Do you, you have something going on? I don't know what it is. Do you all feel it? I feel it. So you've carved your niche and you're still carving your niche on how you're going to impact the social justice movement. Yeah. So what are some things that students can do to take on leadership roles in the political arena, uh, social justice movement, etc.? You know, I think, and so this is the beauty of social media. There are so many avenues for you guys to get involved, but what I want you guys to stay away from is being what we call social media activists, where you put up a post, you hashtag it, stay woke, you walk away, and that's it. You have to be active in your everyday life. There's so much I'm sure you guys can be involved with in your campus. That's why I actually started my 254 Equity Project, because I found that a lot of students who are on college campuses want
want to be engaged in a meaningful way in civic duties. And so I would say to you guys, you know, 2018 is coming up, that's midterms. If you're interested in politics, again, they will love to hire you. People will love to bring you on just so you can get some understanding of the political field. Make sure you do that. Um, I would say see what local organizations, grassroots organizations are in your backyard and how they engage. And also, don't be scared to start something if you want to, right? That's the beauty about generation two. Go free. If you have some, you know, colleagues, classmates who are interested in the same things you are, you guys can come together and start something. I would say that the civil rights movement, part of it, in part, was started on college campuses. So put that in context. The March on Washington, Alabama, Martin Luther King, all of this stuff happened on college campuses. There's power in your voice. There's power in you just being here. So use that in a way in which you guys can energize your community and be a part of something greater than yourself, you know? And don't be afraid to reach out to, to people. So you briefly touched on your foundation, the 1954 Equity uh, Project. Can you uh, tell the students more about what it's about and what cause you actually started? Sure, so I'll start with the cause. I remember being on campus and I was the only I was the only black administrative leader on my campus at the time, not because I was a different campus. And it was at the time that Eric Gardner was just killed. And they came to my office and they were crying. And I, and I said, wow, this is you know really sad. And I shed tears with them. And I remember leaving my office going home, going home to my husband, going home to my kids. And it dawned on me that I get to go home to a place that is safe for me. But for a lot of my students, home was that very college campus we were on. But what I found was that as administrators and as professors, we were not addressing the issue. So here you are, a professor, walking to a classroom, teaching your design lesson plan the day after Eric Garner just got killed, as if nothing ever happened. Like, there are students in your class who look just like Eric Garner. You're not gonna address it? And that sparked something in me because I, I'm that mom. My son is four, my other son is two. I will call the teacher and be like, excuse me, what is this? You know, like what is happening? And so I was like, I can't even imagine if something happened in this world and my son said, yeah, you know, my teacher just went about the day teaching the class that was regular. A few months later, we had Charleston, where Dylan Roof went to a church and shot up the church because the people in the church were black. And then when they arrested him, they didn't take him straight to jail. They stopped at Burger King and got him a Whopper and fries. But he just killed somebody. He killed nine somebody. So what message are we sending as an institution if we just go about our days when things like this happen in communities of students that look just like these victims. So I said, I'm going to start a 1954 equity project because I refuse to allow another day to go by where my students don't feel like they're safe in that institution that they paid money to go to. That doesn't make any sense. So the 1954 equity project, in essence, brings together students and also faculty members to have great conversations about what's going on on campus. Well, how do you feel? How do you feel the day after Donald Trump got elected? What does that make you feel like? I know for me, the day after the election, when I went to my office, I came into my classroom, put my stuff down, and I said, yeah, what we're going to talk about is not anything about these readings. We're going to talk about what just happened in our country and how that makes you feel. And the beauty of that is there were some people in the class who said, yeah, I voted for him, and this is why. And some people said, I didn't vote for him, and this is why. But having those conversations that humanize situations that happen in our society is important. That's what the 1954 Equity Project does. We're not just going to walk around like black and brown men and not being targeted. No, not in my classroom. No, we're going to have that conversation. We're going to have the conversation. If you don't look like these people, 
people who are being killed, how do you become an ally? Because that's what's also important. I'll tell you guys this. We're not going to fix issues of race if every black person and every brown person comes together and says, we're going to fix this. No. If you don't have allies in other races, this fight is over. When Martin Luther King walked across Edmund Pettus Bridge, he didn't walk across that bridge with all black people. There were rabbis with him. There were Asians with him. There was, there was a movement. And that's what the 1954 African Project is. It's a movement. It's saying, let's all come together, students, administrators, everyone. Let's have this conversation and see how we can do our part in fixing this. Because I don't think we have enough brain conversation. Everyone wants to sugarcoat. And earlier you said, you know, the elephant in the room at FDU is race. No, the elephant in this country is race. No one wants to talk about race. You think if you talk about race, the world will come to an end. No, let's talk about race. Let's talk about what makes us different, but let's also talk about what makes us similar. And that's what the 1954 FDU project I definitely challenge you all after you leave to have these tough conversations. It's very important. It's like I'm challenging myself to talk about you guys. I'm going to grow from it. You only grow from discomfort and challenge. So I encourage you all to speak up if you hear someone doing something or saying something that's causing harm to someone else, etc. So please take your words and look for foundation also. Uh, we're running short of time. So one last piece of advice that you would like to leave with you. And then we're going to do the question and answer. Honestly, you guys don't know how powerful you are. And that's not just advice. That is something I want you guys to keep in mind. No matter what the world tells you you can and cannot do, do not listen to them. If I listen to what the world says of me, I'm just an emperor from Nigeria. This is in my country, so why would I want to add to it? You guys are so powerful. And all you have to do is know the power within you and each day of your life cultivate it. People are not prohibited from doing things because of who they are. People are prohibited from doing things because of who they don't think they are. I'm not good enough. I'm not smart enough. I'm not pretty enough. I can't play basketball that good. No, yes you can. Nothing separates you from them. The only difference is they realize that they have power. And that's all I can say to you is when I see you guys, I see so much beauty. I see so much hope. And I just wish that you guys, if you haven't already done so, see yourself the way I see you. And that's really important. Don't let anyone tell you what you can and can't do. And a special message to the black and brown men in this room. I know the world beats you down every day. I know the world tells you what you can and can't do. And I know the world often makes it so you're not viewed as human. But listen to me when I tell you this. They only beat you down because they know how powerful you can be if you knew it. Don't you ever forget that. And as 2018 and 2020 rolls around, it's time for you guys to vote. Remember this? If voting wasn't so important, why did they put in place laws for you not to be able to do it? You are powerful. You are smart. Now let the world know that you know how powerful and how smart you are.
Okay, cool. Um, so we have about 10, 15 minutes for questions, and then afterwards we're gonna um, let that go up. We'll say how you can find her on social media, and whatnot. Just raise your hand. He's good. What do you want to say about people of color who believe that the problems of today do not apply to them? Thank you for the question. So I find that interesting, and I will talk about that. There are people of color who feel as though that's a them problem and not a me problem. But the reason they feel that way is because they've gotten a taste of some level of success. You know? Um, and oftentimes that that clouds your judgment. And I was on TV one day and they were saying how boo-hoo, these NFL players are kneeling and whining over issues that don't even affect them because they make millions of dollars. And I said to them, LeBron James had the N-word sprayed on the front of his house. No matter how much money you make, you are still susceptible to issues of race. You are still susceptible to discrimination. This has nothing to do with how much money you have, but everything to do with how you look. So I would tell those individuals they need to do some soul searching and some reading about how there was class stratification and why they allowed some African Americans to become successful for that very purpose. For them to say, oh no, it can't be done because look at these people. So I welcome everyone's opinion and I welcome that opinion. But as a researcher, I will say that opinion is flawed deeply. What about for white people that feel that race has pertained to them? Or is that the racial conflict that pertains to them? Yeah, they're a part of the problem. <laughs> <laughs> no, but anyone who feels that way is a part of the problem, right? Um, and, and the other thing I believe is there's often this conversation where people say, I don't see race. And when I hear that, I just want to run out of the room screaming. Because when people say, I don't, and, and, and most of the time, it's what, they mean well when they say that. But when you say you don't see race, that means you don't see me. When you say you don't see race, that means you don't understand why when my son drives at night and your son drives at night, you're able to go to sleep and I'm probably going to be awake until he comes home. So I understand and I respect it, but that's why we have to have conversations and share our experiences so you can understand that issues pertaining to race and based on race do exist because the experiences and the conversations that a 17-year-old black boy has had with his parents are not the same type of conversations that a 17-year-old white boy has had with his parents. Again, my son is four, and I have never bought him a toy gun. Not because I don't think, you know, kids should play with all toys, but because I know that there are 12-year-old boys like Tamir Rice who was gunned down for holding a toy gun because as soon as the officers jumped out of the car, they thought he had a real gun. So already my sons are four and two, and they don't even know any other race has impacted their life because you can't even pretend you're playing with a gun because you don't have the same life as your white friends. And that's sad, but I need to have those conversations with my white friends so they can know this is what we mean when we say race plays into every aspect of our lives. Hi. Um, how would you say that race influences the classroom environment? So I think race influences the classroom environment in a good way because I love to have conversations. My teaching style is like, let's all just talk. And I think race influences the classroom dynamic because you get to learn from your fellow classmates like different ways in which they interact. 
Again, I'm Nigerian. Some of my upbringing is different. That's not, Nigerian is not a race, but you know what I mean? That's a culture. But my upbringing has changed the way I view things, and it's important for people to know that conversation. I like diverse classrooms because I want all of us to learn from each other. But one thing I want to touch upon about that is it's not always about diversity. And that's why I think higher education gets it wrong. Diversity, diversity, we want diversity. It's not about checking all check marks to say, hey, we have one black person here and we have two Mexicans here. No, it's not about that. It's about creating an uh, environment that is inclusive. You have all of these people on your campus, but do they feel like they're at home? That, <laughs> you see, that's the issue. Oh, let's bring everyone, you know, colleges count that all the time. We have the most diverse population. We have this many from, you know, Saudi Arabia, and this many from Russia. It's just such an eclectic myth. Okay, great, but if I was to poll those students, do they feel like you are home to them? So my charge for everyone would be, let's stop focusing on diversity, and let's start focusing on inclusivity. Do your students feel as though they are included, and what are you going to make it so they are? <laughs> yes, I feel it. <laughs> Okay. They need you guys. 
You have to know your power. What do you guys want? Is it enough of you guys that want it? Are you signing up this petition? Did you email the secretary of the dean and say, hey, we would like to meet with him or her? And this is what we think is missing from our campus. And it's not confrontational. Remember what I told you guys, it's about your message, not your voice. So tomorrow, if I see you guys marching along these streets, <laughs> I'm gonna be so mad at you. <laughs> yourselves first, right? Organize amongst yourself. What do you guys want? What do you guys need? Nice email. Hey, well, hey, how are you? Well, you're doing well, right? We'll love to meet with you. You're probably busy and swarmed with the end of the semester coming up, but can we schedule a time to meet at the top of the new year? You didn't say what I'm saying? Uh, but you guys have to know what you want. Don't come in there like, yeah, I don't want this, and then she wants that. No, 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 no. Have like 10 things you want, right? 10 things that you all agree on. Maybe you pick three things. Maybe you guys want to speak to streets every month that talks about this. Maybe you guys are asking for a seat at the table, meaning when they implement policies. You want one of you guys to be seated at, I'm giving you guys Jeff. Can mm -hmm. somebody take a note? Hello. When they make policies for you guys, we want at least two representatives to be seated at the table to make sure that that's okay and it's not an on-the-spot decision. You'll take that, whatever they want to propose, back to your group. You guys decide and you say, hey, we like what you're doing, but I actually want to augment it in this way. Like, think through it. These are some of the workshops that 1954 Equity Project does. Like, how do you know your power? And that's part of it. But, again, Nobody wants to hear you say, uh, excuse me, um, I didn't know. <laughs> no. Again, hey, how are you? Hope you had a great day. Um, <laughs> do you know what I'm saying? So make sure you guys do that. That would be my advice. You come together first on your own, then meet with the higher ups, request a meeting, and do it in a very organized fashion. They will listen to you. There's power in your voice, and don't forget, you pay well here. I know you said you know, um, Yes. I was just wondering. Do you think that has a negative effect on yes. African Americans? <laughs> no. Yes. <laughs> uh, yes. Absolutely. Like I'll catch myself because in my other life I was a rapper. So, <laughs> so I'll catch myself like, uh, 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 and then I shoot him in the whoa. <laughs> I can't say that. It matters. Those things matter, and I'm more cognizant now, especially since I'm a mother, and I'm like, like I, I'm listening to songs, and I hear my son maybe he's like picking it up. I'm like. No, we got we, Sesame Street. No, we can't do that. <laughs> so I do think it does. But then, as a researcher, as a professor, I always think from cause and effect. Is trap music bad, or is trap music just a reflection of the society and the community in which they live in? You can't expect some people to rap about something else if that's all they know. But my problem is. It's just, I will tell you guys this, and I'll leave with this. It's all entertainment. What they're rapping about, that's what they used to do. I have met some of these rappers, they're not about that life. <laughs> do you understand what I'm saying? Like, they're not, I don't, I'm telling you, I'm blowing up this, they're not. So they're talking about it because they know it's a commercial value to it. So I don't want you as a student to say, yeah, you know, Miko said this, and then Drake said this. No. <laughs> Did say no? That's my problem with the incident that happened to UCLA basketball players. Like, one of them, like, dude, your brother just got a Ferrari for his 16th birthday, or a number king, or something like that. Why are you still in Louis Vuitton glasses? It doesn't make any sense. Do you understand what I'm saying? So don't fall into that trap because. You'll be the one doing jail time, and they're over there making millions of dollars. So just take it for face value. It's entertainment. We all do it. Even as a local commentator, I'll tell you right now, sometimes we'll have a segment, you'll hear us go back and forth. No, you don't talk about this. That was great. Yeah, you out for lunch. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? So don't take it. Like, don't, so don't get into a fight with your classmate who voted for Trump because you saw Wendy and someone so so like, I'm gonna do this at Wendy. No, because Wendy's having coffee with her Republican friend. <laughs> <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? So I love trap music, but you guys.
guys are smart and powerful and you guys just know that all of this stuff is entertainment. Okay? Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, so the student notes, remember, uh, please, if you have any comments, questions, or anything that stuck out to you, tweet, Instagram, at DU Real Talk. Also, back to yourself, where can you find me? You can find me on Instagram. Yes, call the phones. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, you can find me on Instagram at Wendy Osefo, W-E-F-E-Y-O-S-E-F-O. You can find me on Twitter at Wendy Osefo. And Facebook, I believe my page is Dr. Wendy Osefo. But yeah, and so Marketing 101, if you guys ever want to do anything, make your name or the name of your business. Like, if I'm looking for you, I don't want to have to find Chocolate Deluxe one, two, three. <laughs> no. So it's Wendy Osefo. And if you guys send me a message, I'll take maybe the first 20, and I'll follow you all back. You don't have a voice! What have you been following for a while? Oh, you've been following for a while? Yeah. Oh, baby, okay, listen. Send me a message and say, I've been following you for a while. And none of y'all, listen. <laughs> don't do it. I know your face, so just you. Tell me that, and I'll follow you back. Okay. Okay, thank you. Well, she is married, so no DM slides. <laughs>